to Gwinnett County Public Library's Community Conversations. Today's subject is the complexities of teaching diversity and inclusion issues. Our partner for the series is the Gwinnett Remembrance Coalition. I am Ron Goche. I am the Community Services Partner Partnership Manager for Gwinnett County Public Libraries System. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Paul Grant. He is an associate professor of political science in the School of Liberal Arts at Georgia Gwinnett College. He teaches American government, state and local government, and Georgia politics courses. His published and presented research topics include race, ethnicity, and politics, legislative studies, and state government and politics. Dr. Grant studied the social, political, and economic climate of South Africa 10 years after the end of apartheid on a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship. He is a member of the GGC Sustainability Committee and co-founder of the GGC Community Microphone. We welcome Dr. Paul Grant. Thank you, Ron. And good evening and welcome to another Community Conversation. For this, our first program of our second year, Panelists are gonna discuss what has become a heated topic in American politics, public education. Although for many, it may seem education has never been controversial. However, a, a brief review of our nation's history reveals otherwise. Public education and curriculum in, in the United States has often been influenced by politics and has been controversial. From African-American legislators during Reconstruction, passing legislation creating free public schools in the South, to the daughters of the Confederacy influencing textbook publishers to present positive Im images of slavery, the Confederacy, and segregation, to the efforts of activists in the 1960s and 70s to urge colleges and universities to hire more faculty of color and women and create ethnic studies and gender studies departments and similar pressure placed on book publishers to include more stories featuring people of color uh, in children's books and school textbooks. During the same period, white conservatives resisted integration mandated by Brown, uh, the Brown case, Brown versus Board, 1954, um, uh, and created segregation academies, as well as lobby for vouchers. In the 1980s and 90s, Christian conservatives encouraged members to run for school boards to influence public schools and curriculum, and to use these offices as training ground and stepping stones for higher political government offices. Now, social conservatives are challenging how schools teach issues related to race and identity in state legislatures. These efforts have been successful in over 30 states. Three Southern governors from Virginia, Florida, and Georgia have received considerable national attention for supporting these measures. How has this legislation affected students, teachers, faculty, and school board members, particularly in Gwinnett, but also throughout the state of Georgia and nationally. Our parents, our, our panelists will discuss this tonight. Uh, and this evening, we are joined by several panelists um, that I'd like to go ahead and introduce at this time. And then I'm gonna say a little bit about the, the political um, topic that is gaining all the attention, uh, which is, um, CRT, critical race theory. So let me begin. Um, let me start with, why don't we start with our student. Aduni Noibi is a junior at North Gwinnett High School. Aduni is um, a Gwinnett County organizer for the Georgia Youth Justice Coalition. The Georgia Youth Justice Coalition is a youth-led community-based organization that seeks to empower students by working to build robust and inclusive public education, uplifting young voices and stories, creating coalitions, advocating for change, 
and training youth in a myriad of ways to become engaged citizens with other Gwinnett students to achieve educational justice in Georgia. And thank you for joining us this evening, Aduni. Um, next, and she will be joining us a little later, uh, is Dr. Rebecca Ward. And Dr. Ward is an Associate Professor of Biology at Georgia Gwinnett College, where she serves also as the Secretary of the Faculty Senate. She is a founding member of the United Campus Workers of Georgia, and she's going to join us today in her capacity as a member of K-16 Teach Truth. Teach Truth is a coalition of public school educators and others who aim to defend and even expand equity-centered education for students from kindergarten through college seniors. Groups involved in this collaboration include Gwinnett Educators for Equity and Justice, Cobb County's Stronger Together, Beacon Hill Black Alliance for Human Rights, and the United Campus Workers of Georgia, Local 3265. We also have um, Dr. Therese Johnson. And Dr. Johnson, the chair of the Gwinnett County Public School Board. She joined the board in January of 2021, and she represents all portions of Burkmar, Discovery, Duluth, Meadow Creek, Norcross clusters, in addition to Gwinnett School of Mathematics, Science and Technology, and the Maxwell High School of Technology. A master's degree in public administration from Columbia University and an MBA from Emory University here in Atlanta, as well as an Ed D and, and I think also from Emory, if it may have made a miscalculation. Capella University. Oh, thank you for that correction. She is an educational leader, entrepreneur, and teacher. She is a diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice professional. Dr. Therese is an advocate, activist, author, and artist. She is passionate about ethnic and global education and dedicated to multicultural and multilingual learning. And we are happy to have her here this evening. Um, also with us this evening, and I'm very happy we were able to have him join us because I really did want to get a teacher's um, point of view. Um, and that is uh, Mr. Anthony Downer, the second. And Anthony Downer is an abolitionist educator, community organizer, curriculum developer, educational consultant, equity professional, political strategist, you got a full plate here, <laughs> public speaker, researcher, of critical race studies and education. He currently serves as the equity coordinator for the city schools of Decatur, in addition, he serves as founder and lead learner of Liberation Learning Labs, co-chair of K-16 Teach True Coalition, and vice president of Georgia Educators for Equity and Justice. Um, Mr. Downer holds a Master's of Arts in Teaching, Social Studies, uh, Education from Georgia State University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Chicago. Oh, you spent some time in Chicago. Let's we'll talk about that. Uh, he previously taught high school uh, social studies in Atlanta public schools and Gwinnett County public schools and worked in community organizations, government offices, and political and grassroots campaigns. Anthony was raised and resides in Norcross, Georgia. Now, Dr. Carl A. Grant, the other Dr. Grant. Dr. Carl A. Grant is a Hall Bascom Professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and former chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is one of the scholars credited with founding the field of multicultural education. He has authored or co-authored more than 50 books and has written more than 150, 125 journal articles. Professor Grant's recent books include James Baldwin and the American Schoolhouse, The Future is Black, Afro-Pessimism, Fugility and Radical Hope in Education, Du Bois and Education, Black Intellectual Thought Education, 
Intersectionality and Urban Education, and Selective Works of Carl A. Grant. Professor Grant is currently writing a project on Lorraine Hansberry, author of Raising in the Sun on Black Families and Black Students. Okay, so we got the panel introduced. And now I'm going to take just a little privilege to say a little bit about critical race theory. This is gonna again be really abbreviated, um, critical race theory 101. And essentially because this has been such a popular topic that's kind of been a, a political hot potato, let's say a little bit about what it is and what it isn't, and then we'll call on the experts to, to say a little more. Um, and I'm going to move you all. So basically we know, and again, I'm gonna just highlight certain points that uh, Harvard law professor, Derek Bell introduced this concept. Uh, it, involved, it evolved in reaction to critical legal studies, which came about in the 1970s. Um, so again, the focus uh, I wanna emphasize here is, is his work explored uh, what it would mean to understand racism as a permanent feature of, of American life and whether it was easier uh, to pass civil rights legislation in the United States because laws ultimately served the interests of white people. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, another scholar in this area, uh, again, I'm going to emphasize just certain parts, uh, and she describes it as a way of looking at the role uh, looking a way of looking at law's role of platforming, facilitating, producing, and even insulating racial inequality in our country, ranging from health to wealth uh, to segregation uh, to policing. And Kendall Thomas, again, very briefly, critical race theory tells a story about institutional racial, racial disadvantage and systematic racial inequality. So essentially um, what uh, critical race theorists are emphasizing is um, that basically they are mainly concerned with institutions and institutional uh, racism, right? institutions and systems. Um, critical race theory rejects the philosophy of colorblindness. So these are some other things that we've heard. Again, racism is seen as system systematic, not the actions of individuals who are bigoted. Um, now, the other thing we've heard a lot about was the New York Times 1619 project, uh, which recognized you know, the 400 years of slavery in the United States. Um, and it suggested that uh, in part that the nation's founding was in some ways influenced uh, by slavery and white supremacy. Um, so these were issues that are often you know, brought up by conservatives. Uh, President Trump, former President Trump, before leaving office, uh, commissioned a, uh, a 1776 commission to kind of counter the um, 1619 project. Um, but it's noted that it did not include the work of American, of the American Historical Association uh, and focus mainly on uh, ultra right wing conservative scholars, um, Larry uh, Irons and Carol Swain, political scientists at Vanderbilt. So, how has this affected politics? Uh, Vice President Michael Pence, Mike Pence, basically said uh, critical racism. Ted Cruz said basically is saying that every white person is a racist. So Republican lawmakers have introduced a great deal of legislation throughout the country in a number of states, um, basically uh, more or less outlawing uh, critical race theory and banning it from being taught in school and anything about structural racism. Um, and what's noteworthy here is to see how um, critical race theory has been uh, weaponized and how um, conservative activists have attempted to brand it. And again, this is something that you, we, we know comes out of law schools, but brand it as something that's just a incredibly crazy far left wing theory. Um, Christopher Rufo is one of the leaders in this effort. 
uh, and you know, here are some words directly from him. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. Uh, we have uh, decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructs that are unpopular with Americans. Um, another quote that I think is noteworthy, uh, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the political conversation, uh, into the political conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic. Uh, we, uh, we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand. So that's important to understand that this, you know, is this a disingenuous effort uh, to basically uh, speak to a theory that's trying to uh, explain something. Um, now, uh, in defense of critical race theory, uh, scholars have responded, and again, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, that legislative efforts are scapegoating, that the idea that anti-racism is racism against white people has got to be the oldest talking book or talking point uh, in their playbook. So again, I know many of you are, are familiar with some of these uh, arguments back and forth, but what does this look like on the ground? How is it being operationalized politically? Uh, well, Glenn Youngkin used it quite effectively uh, to win election to the governor's office in 2021. Um, and of course, many of us are familiar with uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' political rights and education bill, also known as the Don't Say Gay bill. And then, of course, here in Georgia, uh, many of us are familiar with House Bill 1084, and I hope to hear from a number of you here in, in Gwinnett County and in Georgia on, um, again, attempts to uh, avoid teaching structural racism uh, and define things as uh, divisive concepts without really defining what those are, um, and efforts to consider certain content obscene uh, or to suggest that parents don't have any rights as it relates to the schools. So having said all of that, I think we are ready to move forward and hear from our panelists. Let's move to um, Anthony uh, to get a teacher's point of view on the ground in terms of how this is affecting uh, teachers and, and classroom education. Absolutely, Dr. Grant, thank you. And of course, the Public Library, thank you so much for hosting this. You know, this has been a multi-year fight um, and as, as a former teacher and uh, um, a supporter of teachers and students, um, we need more public conversations like this, so thank you. Um, this it has been very weird, but, but I, I have to first talk a little bit about the history. This is not new. This is a part of a drive called classroom censorship, um, controlling uh, what teachers can teach and students can learn in our classrooms that dates back centuries. Uh, and, and thank you, Dr. Grant, for giving us some of that historical context, because it's not um, uh, meant to bolster intellectualism, but rather hinder it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what happened just a few years ago from a personal personal perspective. In the summer of 2020, I joined uh, with my fellow teachers at Gwinnett County Public Schools to create an organization called Gwinnett Educators for Equity and Justice. And right before the craziness of that summer, um, we were focused on uh, reimagining our school system. And we began uh, with four priorities for racial equity and justice for our students. And one of them included a, um, an ethnic studies course in Gwinnett County Public Schools, the first uh, of its kind in, in the school system. And as we demanded it, we were hired to uh, curate the course. As we began meeting in late summer 2020 to uh, finalize pieces of the course, that's when um, critical race uh, theory and the tax really began targeting Gwinnett County Public Schools. As you see, uh, GCBS has been a very um, unique example of ground zero. And so when we talk about the attacks, when we talk about the white parents um, attacking school boards and school board members, when we talk about um, uh, the, uh, the lack of support and resources for teachers, Gwinnett County Public Schools was a great example at the time. And what the, the conversations looked like as we were building this course that did not have anything to do with critical race theory as a full theory uh, was that uh, we have to be careful. 
that we have to lessen and water down the standards and the materials because of what's coming, this onslaught that is getting ready to come. At that time, it was just phone calls and emails. It was about to get something uh, much bigger. Uh, but those of us that uh, teach uh, from an abolitionist standpoint or a culturally responsive standpoint, we did not back down because we do teach critical race theory as a framework in our classrooms, many of us do. And it, although it's not in our standards, those tenets um, uh, are so important. The fact that the United States and Georgia are settler colonies, a uh, colony um, that are founded on white supremacy and racism, that's a tenet that we should teach in our history courses because it's the truth. The fact that people uh, of color and their voices uh, and their stories matter uh, in an academic setting, that tenet is true and that's something that we do teach. And we wanted to make sure that was at the foundation of the ethnic studies course. And so today, what unfortunately what we're seeing is that as the law is being implemented, it's now um, grown from HB 1084 and a, a few uh, of its counterparts is grown into the Protect Students First Act in the state of Georgia. And this is not a bill anymore, folks. It was signed into law in July. School boards has had as of August 1st to pass their own versions of that divisive concepts law, what we're calling classroom censorship. And now that policy is being used to target teachers. Uh, teachers are getting uh, complaints from parents uh, and they're getting uh, written up or sent into district office. There are letters and investigations uh, into their files um, at the HR level. Uh, and uh, they are self-censoring. That's probably the biggest impact is that teachers, whether it be in black or white schools, are making the decision to shut up about race, racism, and white supremacy, and therefore, once again, lessening the criticality and intellectualism in our classrooms. Well, Anthony, I appreciate that perspective uh, from a teacher who's on the ground and in the classroom. Uh, and we're gonna hear more from you later as we mix it up with the entire panel. Um, but next, I think I'd like to hear from Aduni uh, in terms of how it's affecting students and what students are doing about this. Um, as a student, I've been very affected by these um, classroom censorship bills and like these acts to censor the truth in, um, in the classroom. And honestly, I'm just very hurt by the fact that I go to school and I can't learn the truth, especially since I do live in Georgia. I go to a school that was once segregated. I like, um, I live on land that was once plantation, um, a plantation. And it really, it's just hurtful to be honest. I don't have any specific words, but that also the fact that people in office are using children like me and saying that they're fighting for us when they're using these classroom censorship bills. Instead, they're hurting us and they're not allowing us to learn and inquire and think and use critical thinking skills. Um, and that's what I have to say for now. It's always good to see young people get engaged in these kinds of uh, political issues that affect their lives. Um, just briefly tell me, how did you get involved in this? And I'm just curious to know, what do your peers think about your involvement in addressing these uh, education and curriculum issues? Um, I got involved um, around like late 2020 with Georgia Youth Justice Coalition. And throughout the past um, eight months, um, I've been working within Gwinnett um, with my peers to find strategies um, to get other students to be aware of these classroom censorship bills and things that are happening that are limiting the truth. I think um, a big issue is that a lot of students are unaware that this is happening and um, they lack the knowledge. So something that I've really been focusing on is like bringing, building a coalition of other students to um, help mobilize and for them to be aware of what is happening. And it's a mixed opinion. Um, a lot of students are upset and they recognize that classroom censorship is not okay and that we deserve to learn the truth in our schools, but some students do side with classroom censorship. So there's been a, a mixed reaction when trying to mobilize my peers. Thank you for sharing that, I appreciate it. Um, now let me hear from the president of the school board. With Dr. Johnson, um, we spoke the other day and you shared with me that um, you know service is something you do, but you were basically you're surprised about you were surprised about what you've encountered. It wasn't what you expected. Can you tell me what you expected serving on a school board and what you've encountered? 
Thank you, Dr. Grant, for your question. And I'd like to also thank the Gwinnett County um, Public Library for this informative session. I'd like to thank a former educator and now leader and administrator in the school system, uh, Mr. Anthony Downer. Um, I've learned so much from him as a teacher um, and now he's evolved to be an administrative leader and um, in, in, the, in the equity space, in the justice space, in the liberation space, and the language and the consciousness related to that has really, um, you know, uh, been beneficial to the movement. Um, and the movement related to um, elevating the consciousness of the importance of making sure that history is not repeating itself making sure that there is equity in our school systems, making sure that our students um, have justice and, and always, always teaching from a liberation mindset. And so I just wanted to give honor to Anthony and all the work that you have done, Mr. Downer, thank you so much. And to Aduni, wow, the students have um, a voice in this process. The students have a voice in how they are impacted. And when we have young people like a Dooney to speak out and speak up and really share about the impact of the legislation, the impact of teachers in the classroom, the impact of our policies and procedures that we as board members support, um, influence, create, um, it, it is so very helpful, Aduni, to hear your perspective. And I encourage all of our students, anyone listening to this session, to please continue to speak out. As a board member and boards across the country, we are all elected members by the people. And our mission is 100% about the children. And when we create policies, which is the central focus of our job, we hire the superintendent, we support the superintendent in the best way to ensure that uh, the superintendent is doing the work to ensure successful outcomes for each and every child. And when we create policies, revise policies, um, it's all for you. It's all for students like Aduni. And so Aduni, um, thank you for your voice and to the other students who may be listening to this, please continue to share your voice because our intent is to always ensure positive outcomes. And sometimes, to be honest with you, the impact is not what we intended. And we, won't, we will never know that unless we hear from the students because ultimately they'll say, ah, that policy didn't work for me. That law did not work for me. And Aduni, what you said is that 1084 is not working for you. And so um, that law, um, unfortunately, is something that many school boards voted in because it's a law. Um, I did not support it personally. I did not vote for it. I don't, um, I fundamentally, morally cannot support a law when I know the spirit in which the law was created was to continue to engage in the suppression of, of black and brown voices, black and brown history, um, the community um, really understanding who they are and, and really being empowered. Because I know that the root of it was based on um, bigotry. So I Dr. cannot Johnson, support that. I can't support it. Dr. Johnson, so tell me what have you, um encounter. I mean, you came into this basically wanting to serve. Um, what's been your experience? Because I got the impression that it hasn't been just doing good governance and, you know, making sure that, you know, the system is running well. T Dr. Tell me a little bit about your experience in the time. Dr. Grant, thank you for the question again. And I, I'm sorry, I, I just, I kind of, talk so much about the teacher and the student. That's okay. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm so passionate about that because I, I, I'm glad you centered them and I'm glad they were first to speak. Okay, yes. so to answer your question, um, you know, I ran for school board because I wanted to make a difference. I'm an educator in the classroom. I started my own school um, and um, I was so committed uh, 
about making a difference for each and every child. And, and, and I'm also a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, professional. I've been in this work for over 20 years. The school I started was, a, was focused on multicultural, multilingual, global education. And I continue to be very passionate about that as a board member. Um, I support it and, and continue to advocate for um, making sure that each and every child feels like they belong. And what, what does that mean? That means that I am very outspoken about equity, inclusion, justice, diversity, liberation, right? And, and it also means that history, the true history that each and every child deserves to learn about their history. I'm from Houston, Texas, and in Texas, I didn't know about my history. So for me as a board member, I openly talk about the importance of our students learning about who they are and where they come from, regardless of, of how it is. And I know as a teacher, we do that with care. I know as a teacher, we do that with consciousness. And it's very important that we educate our students in, in, in historical facts. And I'm unapologetic about that. Now, what the repercussions of that, of my being very courageous around supporting history and student voices and, 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 and exploring um, the past so that we don't repeat it, right? Is that I've, I've received personal threatening messages, um, um, hateful comments. Um, um, I, I have a security system in my home. Um, I am very vigilant around my surroundings. Uh, it has really become a personal threat to my life and my safety and the safety and security of my family and my livelihood. That I did not expect, Dr. Grant. What I expected was I would be a board member in GCPS Public School, which is one of the worst counties in the nation. Right. And that me as a diversity person, me as a person who's speaks multiple languages, has traveled the world, can how I can contribute and add value to this board. I never once thought that I would have a group of people who didn't get me or my message or my activism, my advocacy, my, 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 um, my, my courage, my outspokenness. But I think it's really important for us to be, to really be really bold and courageous about standing for the children. Because who is, if it's not us, who is standing for them? Right. that uh, we don't have yeah. many people doing that dr grant and so um i i believe in in action we can talk the talk and talking the talk actually results in action so talking is action and taking the right uh, strategic moves making the right strategic moves is also critically important for us to make sure that we're making the right decisions and we're strategically um, impacting the lives of the children because at the end of the day, it's about a duni. It's about a duni having and other kids like a duni having an experience where they feel empowered, where they feel um, like they belong, and they not just feeling where they know they belong. And that's the work that we have as school board members, as administrators in our school systems, and as community members and as teachers. Well, thank you, Dr. Johnson. I appreciate you sharing that perspective from the board, um, the view being on the board. Um, uh, Professor Grant, I think he's still with us. Did we lose him? Yes, Dr. Grant, you are mute. I want to say, Dr. Grant, oh, I'm, well, I'm sorry. admirer of you. Dr. Grant, you are so amazing. Thank you so much for all you've done and all of your work going to now come to you uh, and have a couple of questions uh, and then anything else you wish to share uh, from your vantage point there at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so you've been hearing the discussion this evening and one of the things I'm wondering as someone who uh, is very engaged in teacher education at a place that you, like University of Wisconsin and curriculum and instruction, how are you training future teachers to come in this kind of uh, practically toxic political environment, um, as well as scholars uh, who are teaching in various ethnic studies, but any discipline. Uh, again, as you know, even here in Georgia, it does affect from K through 
16 or you know undergraduate education so how are you handling that and, and your fellow scholars at the university of wisconsin well at uh 2 30 central time not not that atlanta time that you guys work with but the real time in the middle of the country <laughs> i met with uh 130 teacher candidates, people, young people who will be going out into the schools two years from now. They were basically all white, except five. And I spoke to them about the fact that in less than two years, they will be entering a class with students who are brown, students who are black, students who are new arrivals in the, this country, which is so important. And we started with asking them about who they were and about their heart. And the class was about an hour and a half. And it was the first class of the semester where you give out the syllabus, you talk about the purpose and all of that. But at the heart of what we wanted to do today and we want to continue with is to help them to understand the importance of being a teacher in this particular moment. And a teacher in this particular moment has to teach about we the people in the truest sense of what that means. So today was a day to initiate it. Tomorrow I do a graduate course on multicultural education for, for grad students. And this is the moment of multiculturalism, more so than when I first started engaging with it in the late 60s and early 70s, because things are so global. I, I mean, the, the social media, we talk to one of pe our people all over. I write articles with people in different places of, of, across the world. But let me say, let me come back to this. When we were talking about critical race theory and we look at it as, as something way over there, one vantage point that I have in the discussion, a good deal of discussion on critical race theory happened not too far from here in Madison, Wisconsin. Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, that whole group of young, brilliant legal minds used to meet in Madison. And they would sit around a table like that, like the teacher's lunchroom, talking and eating and trying to figure out the next step. And when people and, and the, what they wanted was to look at race and racism in this country as it relates to power, as it relates to privilege, as it relates to how do you help all people, we the people, really move this country toward a more perfect union. And we know that it has to start within this country because we say this country is a country of law, that it has to start very much with the legal aspect of things. And I used to sit in the room and listen to these legal scholars who, who are on television now and, and, and what they wanted and how they wanted to contribute. So critical race theory, I mean, they have taken it, they have pulled it, they have twisted it. They have tried to interrupt it. 
They have tried to say it's no good, but they will not defeat it because of groups like this where we will reach out and continue to talk and to continue to demand to have our voices heard. So what do I say to those who want to teach? You have to have your voices heard. You have to teach the truth. You can't walk away from 1619. You can't walk away from the fact this Christmas addict was shot and, and, and say that it did not happen. So these, these are some of the things. And let me say, and this is the first thing I should have said, it's a joy to be with you. I think everybody's in Georgia except me. I saw you guys should send me some Georgia peaches or something that you have down there that I can enjoy up here in cold Wisconsin. <laughs> okay, well, well, thank you for those uh, observations, Professor Grant. Becca is one of my wonderful colleagues who has made me more of an activist than, than I was, and I appreciate her so much. Um, and she has been in the middle of this. And one of the things I wanted to ask her was, you know, working with these issues with K through 12 and being a, a faculty member who's fully engaged with faculty senate and, and, and uh, university uh, employee and faculty union. Uh, why are you doing this K through 12 education issues? So um, Anthony and I met for the very first time. We correspond a little bit um, because we have some shared interests with respect to educational structures, but we met for the first time at a Gwinnett County School Board meeting where I got a whole bunch of my co-workers. Um, I work at uh, Georgia Gwinnett College, although I am not representing that entity in this space. We made uh, that, I made that clear at the beginning. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we came out to the, to the school board meeting and we saw shocking, shocking images of parents yelling at teachers, of parents screaming at black school board members, of parents spewing racist vitriol from the floor. And our jaws dropped. And all of these folks worked at a college where all of these students would probably go within the next few years. And we felt called. This is about the future of our classrooms. This is about the future of our society. And understanding, and I think that a CRT framework actually significantly helps us understand this, understanding that the role of the state with its educational programs is subject to the political whims of any moment, and then can crack down or become more progressive based on what's happening in that state, in that country at that moment. Understanding that what's happening right now in Georgia is that every single person who is getting a public education in Georgia is now being disenfranchised through the theft of a true knowledge. Like that's both me as my job. I want my students to be able to talk with me about the, the real stuff, scientific racism. I teach, I teach genetics and you can't talk about genetics if you don't talk about eugenics and who did that and why. So we have to have that as an educator to do right by my students, but we have to have that also in a larger sense for a society that continues to progress. And I will just end on this. There is no coincidence that there was a huge nationwide revolt around the treatment of black and brown folks in our society. And then suddenly everybody discovers, oh, we should teach less about racism. Hmm. That is not a coincidence. What is happening right now is an attempt to put the lid back on the bottle, but the genie is out. We all know that structural racism shapes the day-to-day -day reality of every single person in the United States right now. 
And yeah, we're not going to shut up about it just because Georgia has said it's illegal. Adeni, we won't do that to you. We won't do that to you. We owe you more. Thank you, Dr. Ward. I, I want to ask a couple of questions. Anyone on the panel can address them. Uh, because I think the perception for those who are so against critical race theory and any discussion of structural racism or anything that has to do with race, especially in the South, but also in other places, uh, is multicultural education only about people of color? That's one of the questions that, is, that seems to be raised. And the other question that often comes up is, and I have some conservative friends, and they can support diversity and inclusion, but when it comes to equity, they have a problem with that part. Does anyone want to speak to either of those issues? I'd like to just sure. say that equity is meeting the needs of each and every child or person and individual. It's really embracing the humanity of all of us. And so for people who don't understand equity, um, I challenge them to continue to do the work around the individual and personal work um, related to being an anti-racist, related to anti-bigotry, related to really understanding what equity means and how equity is actualized in our classrooms, in our communities, and in society. Um, the data tells us so much. And so I would encourage people to really look at the data, look at the research and understand the, the impacts of the systemic racism in healthcare. You can't dispute the data. Mm -hmm. Inequities in the education system and discipline disparities. You can't dispute the data. The information, um, you know, related to wealth building and housing ownership, you can't dispute the data. Yeah, and right? I think, and I was going to say, Dr. Johnson, I think a lot of times they think of equity as uh, equal outcomes, regardless of the amount of effort put into something. Um, so, and, I, yes. Mm -hmm. And what I've heard is people think that equity means that you're taking something away from me. That's and that's it. not what equity is about. Mm -hmm. Equity is about if you wear a size eight shoe, you get a size eight shoe. You don't get a size 10 shoe, mm -hmm. right? How does that look and how do we actualize it in the school system? We actualize it by if you if your parents speak Spanish, mm -hmm. then if we have to share information about what's happening in our school system, we are going to share the information in Spanish. That's right. actual, We're that's going to meet your need. That is ensuring that equity is about access and opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Access mm -hmm. and opportunity. So it is, regardless if you are white, if you're black, if you're Hispanic, Latinx, whatever you are, Asian, it doesn't matter. What do you need? What do you need okay. to be successful? And, and I can appreciate to address those needs. That's what equity is about. It's not about taking anything away from anyone. It's about addressing the needs. There may be a community that may need different things and may require different resources to be successful. So our goal as school board members is to ensure that we are supporting the programming, the funding and the policies that is supporting the actualization of equity. I appreciate that, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Actually, I think I'm going to throw this one back to um, Professor Grant, since you are one of the founders of multicultural education. Um, so does it include white people? Because there's a perception that it doesn't. Can you speak to that briefly? I'm not sure if he's muted. You are mute, Dr. Grant. Carl, you're on mute. Um, Carl. Can someone get them off? Okay. okay, there we go. Yeah, you're when on When I mute. was in grad school, one of my professors gave me a book by John Rawls. It was a big, thick book like this on the theory of justice. And in this book, Rawls talks very much about equity. 
And when he boils it down to really cut through it in simple terms, it's about fairness, a, a, about fairness. And, and what is fair to you may not be fair to you or may not be fair to the other person. So at the foundation, it was fairness. But other people picked up Rawls' thesis and then they took it to with it to the cultural domain and the economic domain. So they also spoke about equity in the term of equi economic uh, justice. And they talked about it in the terms of cultural recognition. And this as it relates to uh, people of color. It also as it relates to people who are gay. So that whole notion of equity, the fairness to everyone. So then, but to move to your question on uh, multicultural education, years ago, we had this debate. Uh, multicultural, yes, it's for white people. Yes, it's for brown people. Yes, it's for black people. Yes, it's for people whose first language is not English, it may be something else. Multicultural education is education that embraces and deals with the different cultural groups and says, welcome aboard. And it, it, its mission, and let me go back to this, this whole thing of we the people in the more perfect union, this is, this is the job of multicultural education to help facilitate this, to help carry it out. And of course, you don't want white people outside the window looking in, you want them in the room. I mean, black people, brown people have been outside of the walls of the room for so long. So why wouldn't we want to have everyone here? We know the wisdom of not having people in the room. So that's just quickly, yes. Simply put, it, it's for everyone. Well, thank you. I'd also like to add Dr. Grant and and uh, both Dr. Grants. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> multicultural, <laughs> multiculturalism. And I, I wrote a book called The Global Purpose Approach. And in the Global Purpose Approach, you know, multiculturalism includes white people. It includes black people. It includes brown people, right? Um, and when we look at culture and we think about the definition of culture, it is the way of life. Yeah. It is learning and understanding the nuances, is learning and understanding the language, the currency, the economics, the mm -hmm. politics, the, the ancestry, the heritage, the music, dance, food, art. Mm -hmm. This is, it, there, there's so many elements of understanding culture. And it is so profoundly important for our children to understand the richness of their history their culture and their heritage, and to also learn and understand that of others. Because when we think about this bridge of, of globalism and this bridge of competitiveness, when we talk about as school board members and as educators, we want our children to be competitive. Mm -hmm. We want competitive people. We're not talking about just the United States. We're not talking about just our little community. We're talking about the world. Mm -hmm. And when we wanna prepare our students to be globally competent, globally competitive individuals. They must understand multiculturalism. They must understand the language, the nuances, the, 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 the cultural um, um, importance and relevancy around um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, in, engaging with other people who are different from them. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's so important to even dismantling the individual racism we all hold, right? Mm -hmm. We all hold biases, we all, uh, reflect in our own history and our decision making. Um, you know, there are opportunities for us to grow and learn, right, from differences. And so, I just encourage us to continue to learn and grow from differences, and to see multiculturalism as something that is so very beautiful and a way to really heal and connect our world. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, we are at the hour, uh, and I don't know, Ron, if we. Can, I guess we maybe start it live a few minutes later. I don't know if there are any final comments that we want to hear or we have time to hear. Ron, I will follow your lead on that. Let's let's do some final comments and then we'll close out after that. I appreciate that. Um, 
So why don't we just briefly hear from everyone, knowing that we are at our, but uh, Aduni, did, was there something else that you wanted to share about your experiences with this work? I just wanna say it was so inspiring and empowering to hear all of you guys talk. Um, and I really in her liked hearing Dr. Grant, um, your work with multicultural education and Dr. Therese and Mr. Downer. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, I'll definitely be sharing some of the things that I heard from you guys today with my peers and um, others at Georgia Youth Justice Coalition. And it feels great to know that there's adults and people in the school system who care and are willing to listen to youth voices. Well, and Aduni, thank you for having a strong youth voice that's also engaged in uh, this policy debate. So we uh, see someone like you and we really appreciate what you're doing. And thank you for joining us this evening. So, um, so may I ask the, uh, the student, uh, what, do, what do you plan to major in when you go to college? Um, I'm planning on majoring in public policy for now. And, I'm and still- public politics. Well, you want to come to Wisconsin? See, we'll no. bring you ready. No, you don't want to come Columbia. to Columbia. Oh, you should at least come here. University of Chicago, here. come on. Oh, <laughs> wait, I see, I'm going to bring a right at the University of Chicago. Come, come here to Madison. Public then policy, then we, Columbia. And we're constantly recruiting good people. She's just been so terrific. You know, I want to say, come on into the cold weather. <laughs> Aduni, that, that's quite an invitation. You might want to have a sidebar later on, but um, well, thank you, uh, Professor Grant. Um, let's see, where is, where's Anthony? I, I heard him talk about University of Chicago. It's, it's cold there too. Here I am, uh, and, and I could, uh, Dr. Grant, uh, just, I'm just glad to be in the number, but when you were talking about the the Midwest being the centerpiece. That that's that's where it is. That's that's who really runs the country, huh? We we know, we know. <laughs> um real quick, I, I I do want to address the actual law because someone asked um what how do we support teachers, students? Y'all, this is bigger than this has grown bigger than critical race theory. In fact, the law does not mention critical or race or theory. It's not in there. So right. the thing that we thought they were going to ban they have shifted and, and you have people in Gwinnett saying, we know teachers aren't teaching critical race theory. It's that's why we call it a classroom censorship. It doesn't just target K through 12 classroom instruction, but also any training that teachers uh, go through, whether that be at higher ed or job embedded training. So my role as equity coordinator, even though I'm in the space representing myself as a Gwinnett resident and um, an organizer, my job as equity coordinator and CSD means that I cannot require, my office cannot require teachers to go through anti-racist or equity training or any other professional development that prepares mostly white teachers to teach black and brown scholars. And then at the higher ed, it impacts once again that to those teacher training programs, anti-racist programs, equitable programs like at Georgia State University. And so when you're thinking about how do you, what do you do? We need you to agitate, disrupt, and organize with us. Uh, my comrades like Aduni, like Dr. Therese, like Dr. Ward have been out in the streets. We've been in our email boxes writing emails. We have been educating. We have been fighting and we need more folks to join the effort. So yes, we will drop our contact information so that you can come to our next rally or protest. So you can come to our next workshop. So you can blow up your principal, your teachers, your school board members to hold the line on equity. Don't turn back keep it ahead. We have to ensure that culturally responsive education and equity can benefit all of our students. So if you think about how to, how to support, plug in because we need more bodies on this side of the line. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I really appreciate that you were able to join us this evening. Thank you again. Um, and we need to also hear from uh, Dr. Johnson. I think I've said a lot and um, I, I, I really appreciate Aduni and Anthony and um, Dr. Grant, um, both of you all for uh, your leadership and your perspective. And I'm a huge admirer of Carl Grant and his work and his leadership. And so it's really an honor y'all, Aduni and Anthony, if y'all don't know him, I, you know, my dissertation 
was on multicultural education. The book I wrote, The Global Purpose Approach, was on multicultural education. And Grant and so many others were a part of that process of learning and growing and understanding um, more about this space. And so I, I just want to give honor to, um, to Carl Grant here um, for, for, for your work and your leadership and your, your courage and your, um, you know, everything that you've done to make a difference in this space. Thank you so very much. Um, so we honor you and I honor you and, and I, I have a great respect and admiration for you. So thank you. And Aduni, I look forward to working with you and hearing from you soon. Connect with Anthony if you haven't yet. Um, and Anthony, I'll see you soon. <laughs> Thank y'all. Professor Grant, were you were you done? Did you have anything else since this is well, such I a mean, weird treat? It's such a pleasure uh, to be to to be with you because I mean Georgia is all over the news these days. Uh, school boards, what they are doing, what they are not doing, what people are trying to stop them from doing within schools. It's critical today, and we're not going back. Um, I mean, we are not going back. So that whole notion of this balloon about critical race theory, that's not where it is. And I want to say the young people today, the young people today are not going to tolerate it. They are not going back. So we need to move forward. We need to help them to move forward, to prepare them to move forward. And we need to be in conversation with one another. So we do move forward as a people with a large P on that. Well, thank you, Professor Grant. And with that, I believe we are at the end of our program. And once again, we've had a community conversation that created more light than heat and informed and educated the residents of Gwinnett County about an important salient public policy issue. I want to thank our panelists. Aduni, Aduni, help me out again with your last name. I hate. Noibi. Noibi. Thank Noibi. You. Oh, that's easy. Noibi. Noibi. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, my, my good colleague had to leave, but Dr. Uh, Rebecca Ward, um, Dr. Therese Johnson, um, Mr. Anthony Downer II, and of course, Professor Carl Grant. Also, please allow me to acknowledge the outstanding contributions of the Gwinnett County Public Library and particularly staff members, Marion Myers and Ron Gauthier. I'm going to get it one of these days, Ron. Once again, thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening.